Hey everyone, welcome back to the MMA Vivid section with me, Zane Simon, and my co-host Connor Rebish. I know we're running a little late today because fuck it, I had some shit to do this morning and we're <laughs> running late. That's how that's how it goes. I could not help it. I could pretend I could help it, but whatever. Listen, we're running late today because Mayweather McGregor happened last weekend, and this is the UFC's bold follow-up. It it's is Volkov it's- versus Struve, and it's not a terrible card, but it's really not a great card. <laughs> <laughs> it's not it, that it big wasn't of a, deal. a terrible card when Jermaine Durandamy and uh, Marion Renault were co-headlining, and when yeah. like uh, you know Marco Sogeria de Lima was supposed to be on there, and Islam Makachev was supposed to be on there, then it wasn't a terrible card. It is officially now a terrible card. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, mean it's yeah, it's got some highlights, but it's not great. C.R. Baharazada, God love him, has fought once since 2013 mm-hmm. in a pretty mediocre fight with Brandon Thatch. And he's co-maining against a dude that nobody knows. So everyone should just stop watching now because... Yeah, okay. Especially the with camera, my difficulties. The, I know you're not is... my looks anyway, so the fact that my camera's <laughs> fucking up makes this show especially pointless. I just thought the camera was rejecting the uh, fight card. <laughs> Well, let's get into it. This incentivizes us to go quickly, so we'll try and tear through some of the less compelling fights and get to the ones that really are interesting to us. Indeed. Um, yeah, the, the so starting out right away, Tibal uh, Guti, Andrew Holbrook, and uh, yeah, it's that's our opening bout, lightweight bout. <laughs> Talk about it. Okay. Uh, so uh, Guti was originally, um, a few months ago, I think, he was scheduled to fight uh, a fight that he would have lost. I'm trying to remember who it was. Oh, yeah. Um, I think it was versus Maestro. Dong Hong. Yes. Yeah, Maestro Dong Hong Kim. Kim Maestro. pulled out. This is a much more forgiving matchup. Andrew Holbrook is not like a bum of a fighter by any means, but he's really a grappler. And unfortunately for him, though he is a not a terrible wrestler, he typically relies on his opponents to grapple him to find a path to victory. It's probably because he's got a great headlock and back take game when somebody else tries to take him down. Uh, if Gucci can keep standing, then his completely non-existent head movement isn't such a huge problem in this fight. He's the more comfortable fighter, the faster, more comfortable striker, faster, more powerful. I think it could be interesting, but I'm going with Gucci by second round TKO. Oh, man, but Tabal Gucci has failed to win so many fights you have picked him in. Oh, that's true. But Holbrook, I I also thought Holbrook could do a little better, and he's now been knocked out twice in under 30 seconds. Yeah, Holbrook has some serious, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever's in Patrick Cummins sports drinks, Andrew Holbrook drinking a lot of it. Yeah. (laughs) Um, yeah, I might be inclined to to agree. I, um, I just, I don't know. I mean, we're talking, we're coming off like, uh, you know, a minute knockout loss for Tibal Guti and then two submission losses, one of them in 20 seconds. So get knocked down first. It's all about somebody testing his chin. True. Typically. Holbrook has some power. He's, he's big and strong, but he's just so breakable. I'm going to pick Holbrook here, though, still. I think right. that he can just – I don't know. I don't trust Goody at all. That's really yeah. all it is. I don't trust either of them, which is why yep. we should move on. <laughs> we should move on. Odds on that fight. Uh, Holbrook comes in at minus 175 and has basically stayed there a little up and down lately in the past day. It leaves him at minus 169 still. He dropped way down and then went right back up. But or not way down, but drop down to minus one seventy seven and up to one sixty four. Whatever. Uh I'm I, I'm out of it today, so you have to excuse me. Goody <laughs> the underdog, plus one thirty five now plus one forty two after opening. So now great, and we've lost Connor now. So those odds have stayed pretty static. Not a lot of people betting on this one. No, it doesn't look like it. <laughs> Terrible fight. All right. Know. Light heavyweight bout. 
Boyan Mihailovic, Abdukarim Edelov. Edelov should stomp the shit out of Mihailovic, even after a couple of years on the sidelines. The only reason Mihailovic is in the UFC is because, you know, I don't even know why. I think they felt like they needed him for one of their European shows. Maybe he had ties to somebody. Maybe he was somebody's friend. He's clearly not in any kind of shape enough to compete at this level and doesn't have anywhere near the skills. So I've always found him, his, his inclusion on the roster a mystery and at a lot of it's a legit talent. So I like this. I don't know if our viewers are getting this, but there's a lovely sort of indigo color that is now overtaking your camera. It's really pleasant to look at. So I'm going to use that as inspiration to get through this one quickly. Mihailovic is still in the UFC and this is why Abdul Karim Adolov has all sorts of, unsavory, to say the least, affiliations with um, Ramzan Kadyrov and his regime in Chechnya. And while I'm sure that means he's been active training with the Akhmat crew since his last fight, uh, it does mean the UFC probably shouldn't have signed him, but they did. They signed him to beat Boyan Mihailovic. That's what he's going to do. I say first round submission. Yeah. Edelov, he's got a ton of experience and he's still young and he's made some big leaps lately. Yeah in terms of upping his boxing and his output and his sort of being a more patient technical fighter. And he's just going to run through this dude. Yeah. Um, odds on that fight. Uh, Boyan Mihailovic opening at my, plus 335, now up to plus 438. Edelov opening at minus 505, now out to minus 609. So all that going in exactly the direction it should be. Yeah, can't complain. Uh, that brings us to featherweight Mike Santiago, Zabit Magomed Sharipov. Yes, the man with the unpronounceable name, Zabit Magomed Sharipov, um, is a highly touted prospect. You could call him certainly a blue chip prospect from Russia. He's insanely tall and long for this division. Uh, the irony at first was that he was supposed to fight Nick Hine at this event. Nick Hine, who just lost to James Vick, a gigantic lightweight, moved down to featherweight to fight a guy who is basically bigger than most lightweights, at least in terms of maybe not mass, but height and length. And uh, Magomed Sharipov knows how to use that length to his advantage. He's got a really nice, kind of like a Soviet-style boxing game with good, efficient footwork, uh, uses his jab, sets up his power shots, throws combinations. He's inexperienced. He's still a little raw in some regards. He can be uh, kind of pressured and thrown off a little bit, can retreat in straight lines if somebody really comes after him. And I think that is Mike Santiago's path to victory here. Santiago is a very powerful puncher. He's had some professional boxing experience and it shows if we're still learning lessons about the crossover between MMA and boxing, this is a great uh, avenue to explore that because Santiago's boxing experience has made him a devastating combination puncher, surprisingly hard to hit clean in the pocket, very effective if he can get to that mid range. Uh, so I think we're in for a back and forth fight here. I think this is actually going to be a lot more compelling than Magomed Sharapov versus Hein would have been. Mm -hmm. I think that the advantages for uh, the Russian are, of course, his length. He's going to make Santiago work and suffer a lot of uh, potential injury and pain as he gets to his ideal range. And even in there, we have to remember that Magomed Sharapov is also uh, a very capable uh, wrestler, and his ground and pound is maybe the most scary aspect of his game. He uses that length to just posture up and drop devastating straight shots on his static grounded opponent. So both guys dangerous. I think Magomed Sharapov deserves to be a slight favorite still, especially because Santiago's coming in on short notice after a recent fight. But I'm expecting a good one. I'm going with Magomed Sharapov by unanimous decision. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I have some concerns eventually from Sharapov about... Uh, the ability to translate his size into physicality in the UFC. Sure. Because, yeah, he's tall, but it's very, he's like... Rail deep, thin. Ra rail thin. And so I do wonder about somebody like Santiago getting in there and bullying mm -hmm. him, because a lot of the guys, too, that Magamacharpa uh, fought over in Russia were a lot smaller than him. Mm -hmm. Like... 
you know, they were dudes who maybe would be dropping down to 135 in the UFC fighting a guy who is a true 145-er. Mm-hmm. Um, and Santiago is definitely not that. He's a very, he seems like himself a very big featherweight. So I'll be very interested to see if he can get in and bully Magomasharapov a bit, um, especially because Magomasharapov has a tendency to be a little relaxed. I mean, he fights at a very even pace. It's not that it's not super low output, but it's not high output. He's not going out there and just yeah. taking it to people. And if Santiago can put on pressure, he might be able to like shake him out of that relaxation enough times in a row that he tires out or yeah. takes a big shot that he just can't like he's too relaxed so that the relaxation can turn into panic if you're too relaxed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, the big thing is though, that I, I think, you know, the, the kind of the core uh, of Santiago's game are both a scrambling grappling game. He's not a great wrestler, but he's a very good scrambler. And, uh, Kind of on the feet. It's sort of like it carries over to his game on the feet as well, or his tra- grappling game is a translation of his striking game. And that, like, where he's really at his best striking is when he can kind of square up and really just get people into this sort of scrambling boxing match. Where, mm-hmm. and I think that presents e- even being better than average at slipping shots, staying defensive, and mostly just being very comfortable in the pocket. I think his tendency to just kind of square up and let his hands go really gives Sharapov, Magomed Sharapov too many opportunities to snipe. Right. Is is Magomed Sharapov, does his relaxation indicate a uh, potentially overconfidence that could be shattered? Or does the game plan Santiago might try to use to prove that point, uh, does that represent his own overconfidence, right? Like, yeah. is he going to put himself at risk trying to be too aggressive against a really composed fighter? So for, for the moment, I'm going to bet on Char- Margot Bacharpov's striking to carry through his his sniper-like accuracy in there because he really does a great job picking his yeah. shots when he sees them. And, but if, it, if physicality ends up being a problem, if Santiago can bully him, if he can make him scramble and like out-scramble him because he's bigger mm-hmm. or because he's more powerful, then... It could be. This will be interesting for Michael Sharapov. Like he's one of those fighters I watch, and I'm like, yeah, I see the obvious talent there in on tape, but I really wonder how his frame and his style is going to translate to the UFC, where everybody's a bit right. big. And 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 to get used to that, like to feel that without being really thrown into the deep end. I, I'm not a fighter, but if I was Magomed Sharapov or his management. I might have not taken this fight after Nick Hine pulled out because, like, that's a good entryway into the UFC. Mike Santiago off of a big knockout win in the first round is a much stiffer test. Yeah. So uh, odds on this are, are a bit skewed to that degree. Um, Magomed Sharapov is uh, opened at minus 400 and adjusted up to minus 365 and has since been dropping that back down to minus 407. And Santiago opening at plus 280 and now up to plus 316. Might be worth a look at Santiago at those odds. Yeah, because, you know, he's he's a very capable, pretty ex- reasonably experienced fighter. Yeah, he's twice point. as experienced. He's only two years older, so it's not like he's past his prime, or he shouldn't be. doesn't look like it. And um, he's also been streaking lately like he's got i think 10 straight wins in his last like he's beaten some solid guys so he is not a fighter to be overlooked yeah he definitely and you know a, a lot of his lo- his losses have all been other than a a ko and loss in his third fight in t- 2010 all of his losses have been by submission mm-hmm. so uh you know that it's not. I'm not saying that Magomed Sharapov. He he obviously has. You know, he's has submissions on his record, but that's not what he's looking to do out there. Yeah. And Santiago, to his credit, like the the recent footage of him in fights, he's a very good scrambler. Mm-hmm. 
Like he really does well to get himself through position. So I'm kind of interested in this. Kind of reminds me of Brian Kelleher a lot stylistically. Yeah, I can see that without the rest without the power wrestling game. Santiago, sure. I mean, he does have yeah, some yeah. of that, but Kelleher is very much a wrestle boxer who yeah. has put power behind his boxing. And Santiago is more of a like a scrambling grappler who is also or a, yeah. a power boxer who then has learned to grapple and scramble on the ground. He's he's Kelleher, but instead of the wrestling background, it's a boxing background. So it's Kelleher with like fewer takedowns and a lot more combinations. Yep. Um, that brings us to a light heavyweight bout: Frantomar Bahos versus Alex- Alexander R- Rakic or Rakic. I think it's and, um, Frantomar, he's in that one of the he's in that position that the UFC reserves for a few random fighters, and I'm never really sure how they pick out who these guys are <laughs> or what makes them th- that fighter. Hani Yaya is one of them too. Um, it seems at this point John Moraga has become one, and it's like. They either fight champion contenders or they fight absolute newcomer nobodies. Yeah. And that's it. And uh, this is another, you know, absolute newcomer in in Rakic. And Bohost can absolutely be tuned up standing, but he is massive and powerful fights at a pace that really doesn't play to being powerful at all. But he is powerful. And he kind of tends to scare the shit out of a lot of people, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of have to be a a very confident fighter to fight him. Otherwise, as we saw in his fight with Elvis Matopchich, um, guys just kind of like, oh, I don't want to do this. Guy's That's cute. like exactly the type of guy who loses to Bohos because he just gets yeah. bullied. Yep. And Rakic, he's got a good, powerful kickboxing style to him. Just, I don't know that it's complete enough at this yeah. point. Like, this feels like a too, you know, some fighting somebody too experienced while you're too green. Bohos isn't easy to hurt. He can take a shot really well. He's got a grinding slow as hell style but he makes that work against most fighters yeah but Hose is like surprisingly crafty at range even if it makes no sense for him to be as crafty as he is yeah. like he will like slip a shot sneak in a right hand hit an angle and like these things don't really appear when the fight gets kind of heated but nor do they allow him to make the fight heated which is what it often seems like he should want to do but He's. I don't expect him to just get destroyed at range simply because he's facing a very tall kickboxer. And then with Rakic's, you know, regional area and his background, I kind of just have to assume that Bohos's wrestling and submission grappling are going to be sizable advantages. Yeah. So uh, Rakic, if Bohos consents to strike with him on the feet, which he may do, then Rakic will definitely have an opening. But I think the safer pick is Bohos by a decision or possibly a late submission. Yeah, a grinding, ugly decision. Yeah. That's how he wins. If he if he wins yeah. this fight the smartest way possible, he just grinds the shit out of Rakic. Uh, he is actually a slight underdog in this fight, opening at plus 100, adjusting up and down a bit, and uh, lately rising up to plus 107. Uh, Rakic opening at minus 140, adjusting up to minus 120, and slow trending back down to minus 132. I, I'm a little surprised about that. R- Rakic's 8-1 and one record, you know, I know he's a finisher with a lot of first-round finishes, but his best opponent at, to date is Marcin Prachnio, who is a also just kind of under-tested physical phenom who went over to one eventually and has been doing well there. But th- it, it's, other, you know, otherwise fighting a bunch of dudes on the Austrian regional circuit is not really meaningful. Right. Um, 
That brings us to a lightweight bout. Rustam Habalov, Dez Green. Good fight. One of the better ones on the card by far. Uh, Dez Green looked pretty fantastic in his UFC debut against Josh Emmett. It wasn't like a... Yeah, it wasn't like a fight that he won every single exchange or every single moment, but it was a very like boxerly kind of performance. He he found his distance. He survived the first round and got his reads. He worked his jab. He mixed in his wrestling, and he hurt Emmett twice pretty badly in the third round. So really just kind of slowly took over and looked like a fighter who really could in a few years be find a home in those five-round fights. And so I think this is a perfect matchup because uh, Rustam Khabalov is like officially the guy who who is pretty good but not amazing. He's he's had a, almost nothing but close fights in the last like three or four years since his big knockout wins uh, upon first entering the UFC. He always seems to find a way to slow the fight down and make it so that his big explosions will steal rounds. Um, but as far as keeping volume out there, feeding his opponent looks, and uh, and like uh, actively controlling the pace of the fight is not something Kabalov does particularly well. In those moments, it's like he has to then suddenly call upon the energy he's been saving to react quickly and scramble free. And if he doesn't, he's going to drop around. So it's a tough fight because Des Green has been a guy in the past who's kind of been shaken out of his game plan. Uh, if Emmett, for example, had been a lot more successful in the first round or landed even just one really big shot that got Green's attention, it might have taken Green a whole other round to get into his rhythm. And Kabbalah is certainly capable of doing that kind of thing. But I think he just does not put enough volume out there. And he's not going to have a big wrestling advantage over Green, which is something he often relies on, is being able to throw his opponents around. Green's a good wrestler good defensively and offensively, and a very capable scrambler too. So I like Green to survive those big explosions and rack up points with his uh, shots from range and maybe the occasional reactive takedown here or there. I like Green by uh, decision. <sighs> yeah, this is tough for me because I actually have the feeling that kind of one of the things that let um... – that made were such was such a, a problem for Emmett in that fight was really that he ha felt he had to push a pace on Green that his own uh, that he he wasn't technically clean enough to get away with, really. or that maybe his like his build made it so that he had to get inside all the time. Yeah, he had to get inside. He had to be constantly trying to push and get in Green's face, and it left him open to getting picked off on the counter because green conceded a lot of space in that oh. fight a lot and really spent you know had most a lot of his success fighting off the back foot and hurting emmett that way and i think that i don't really think he can afford to concede that space to rustam Habalov. um i think if he fights off the back foot he gives Habalov room to work he gives Habalov room to set up his strikes and room to be patient and creative and set up the game he wants to set up, then I think it's it becomes some suddenly much more incumbent on Green to find ways to take over the fight. And Habalov is a very tough fighter to take over. True. Um I, I'm going to pick Habalov here to pick up a decision, and I think that he can be just, you know, he can he can be just creative enough and land just enough out at range to keep Green a little bit off of his game and not give him much to counter. And then I think even if he can't, even if he doesn't blow Green out of the water with his wrestling, I still think he wins the wrestling exchanges. Mm. Yeah, for for all that I can I can talk about uh, Khabalov's fights all being close, they're not against bad fighters. Like he faced a new and improved Jason Sago and beat him. He faced a similarly new and improved Leandro Silva and beat him. Chris Wade, Norman Park, like his last four are all very credible wins. And so it's not like Yancy, or Jorge Masvidal and Yancy Medeiros before right. that. Yeah, true. So. 
I just, yeah, I think Dez, I, I, I mean, I do think that, th- that his last fight is a sign that Dez Green has finally clicked. He's been fighting a ton, but only over five years. Right. And it seems suddenly like he's finally solidified his striking game into something functional. But I just don't think that he can pull it. He can, I don't think he can use his wrestling in his back pocket as his ace up his sleeve in this fight. Hmm. And I don't think he can concede space to Hopalov. Yeah, because the, the thing with like experience, obviously experience is always um, something fighters want. And we generally talk about it as, a, as an advantage. But Green could very, very easily just turn out to be one of those young veterans that I love to talk about yep. where he's done all this fighting in such a short period of time. It might make him really crafty, really difficult to finish, uh, really difficult to hurt. It might make him especially well suited to figuring out opponents that he hasn't really had a lot of time to research. But in a lot of cases, it also produces a fighter who, like, he knows too many things to just be aggressive and just take the fight. He knows yeah. too much about how an opponent can surprise him because, like, 30 of them have in the past at one point or another. So, yeah, if if Khabilov lands those big shots, if he can stuff the wrestling, I th- would not be shocked if Green sort of reverted to his old state and, and struggled to... Um, struggle to take over the fight. Yeah. Odds on that. Uh, let's see. Where are they? Da, 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 da. Des Green is the heavy under, reasonably heavy underdog, opening at plus 160 and uh, jumping up pretty quickly to plus 255, now at plus 251. Havilov, a sizable favorite, opening at minus 210 and dropping quickly down to minus 330, now at minus 319. So, sizable odd. I would say those odds are a stretch on Havilov. I would uh, agree. Especially for opponents of Green's caliber, yeah, he does not tend to win that big. So, to me, it feels a bit like I, I think there's room to, for this to be like a, a close split decision where oh, yeah. a few moments of offense in a couple of rounds make all the difference to who who gets the, the win. This is definitely one of the more meaningful fights in the card, but it does not mean it's going to be the most exciting. No. I think it really could be a slow one. Yeah. Uh, after that lightweight bout, Michelle Pizaris, Mads Burnell. Um, watched some tape on Burnell. I like his. I like what he's building. He seems mm-hmm. to have a good front headlock game. He seems to be a. He seems to be learning a capable volume striking game. Like he's a very he's very willing to use it. It's just often th- there's a lot of throwing a lot of things at range that don't land because he his sense of distance and timing is not that great yet. But he's a very willing boxer at times, and he's got a good front headlock, good top grappling game. I don't think any of that helps him against Michelle Pizarris, frankly. Uh, he just looks like a guy who's not ready for what's in front of him. Whereas Pizaris, he's one of those fighters I did not expect him to improve the way he has. He's now 36. He has been fighting since 2000. And in the past, uh, really, I think since about his split decision to Valmir Lazaro. So in the past couple of years he has obviously turned a major corner in his game. Part of that seems to be just um, cardio confidence, maybe doing some better training, maybe getting some more full-time work in than he used to, but his combination striking has picked up another notch. He seems like he should get tired, but he doesn't. He's always been a capable power wrestler, and a uh, he's a little too small to really grapple the way he wants to on the ground in the UFC, but he's a very solid top position grappler who's hard to shake. And it's just a well put together style that's made that much better by a really confident combination boxing game these days. So I think this is all Prezeris and he even if he doesn't get uh even if he doesn't get a stoppage he gets a very one-sided decision yeah um 
clearly what happened with Michel Prezerich is he called up countryman Francimar, uh, or Francisco Trinaldo, and uh -huh. he said, uh, you know that Brazilian death god you've been praying to who granted <laughs> you eternal life and the ability to keep getting better in middle age? Give me that number. <laughs> yeah. Because I am also a fire hydrant of muscle who is too old to be doing this and still improving. And I would also like to continue improving and getting better. And he has. He's, I think the big thing for Prezerich is that he's just finally become really comfortable in his fights. So yep. just like Trinaldo, like Trinaldo still gets tired in every fight. And so does Prezerich because there's no way with that build and when you throw everything as an explosion that you're not going to get tired. But the key is learning where to find rest in the midst of the fight, learning when to hold on to a clinch, when to dance around at range and shake your legs out, like just when to build up to your second wind. And these days, Prezerish very rarely looks bad in a fight because he's gassed. He always seems to find a way back into it. He finds that second wind, just like Trinaldo. Um, and that's just going to be too much for Brunel. Like the experience difference here is massive. Brunel is putting together a good game, but he's not really fought anyone of note. No, like his one competition of his, is terrible. Yeah. His, his last his, win looked like a work. It was right. weak. And it was over, over a guy named Fernando Duarte, who has also been beating nobody of note in Brazil, whose own record is really comprised of not much. So he, yeah, he got a he got a front headlock and looked like he was going for like a what would that be? Like an anaconda that he just he sort of like turned the corner like he was going for the back and the dude just tapped out. Like it wasn't <laughs> it was just it's, it, like he, it was really weird looking. Yeah. The, 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 the odds seem high that Brzezerich is going to show Brunel quite a few things he has not experienced before. So Brzezerich, I think by decision, I think Brunel might be tough enough to survive. And Brzezerich is not a great finisher, but um, I think Brzezerich will mostly dominate. Yeah. Uh, odds on that fight. Michelle Brzezerich. Uh, Brzezerich. Um, where the fuck is all the odds on this are all mixed up. Okay, yeah. He is favored opening minus 385, adjusting to minus 358, and falling back down to minus 377 now. Uh, Burnell opening plus 265, adjusting to minus 276, and since trailing now, really starting to go up lately now at plus 294. So fine by me. I mean, honestly, I yeah. think they could be longer. Yeah, I think they could be longer too. I think there's a reason that Brunel is becoming a much bigger underdog as the fight it's, approaches. Again, it's it's not that Brunel's a joke, right? No. We've learned from May Mac saying someone's going to lose is not calling them a bum. It's just that there's no reasonable reason to expect Brunel to have this be his first meaningful win. Yeah, there really isn't. Uh, that brings us to a lightweight bout, Merbeck Tysimov versus Felipe Silva. And I am really glad this fight held together because I really like Tysimov and I think Felipe Silva is a ton of fun. Mm -hmm. Um, he, Silva, you know, he's got this very Brazilian Muay Thai style where it's, a lots of brawling hooks. Dig, mm -hmm. You know, he, he actually changes levels well when he throws, which is nice. But lots of brawling hooks and lots of clinch work. Um, and a really actually crafty clinch game, which is nice to see. You know, more of the Matt Brown style clinch game than mm -hmm. just let me get my arms around you and throw knees nonstop. Yeah. Fewer, fewer um, thigh knees. More pick your poison tie clinches, please. <laughs> yeah. And so he'll be fun. I don't think he'll beat Merbeck Tysimov. Just this is kind of a like this is sort of a Mike Santiago Zabit Mogomed Shirapov fight for me in the same way. Where it's like you have this come forward brawler who is actually, you know, a really pretty good, capable power striker with some real craft to his game. And then he's he's going to be coming forward against a sniper who is really good at picking people off. Yep. Um, and that's really just the problem, is that Tysimov, as we saw in his fight against Demir Hadzovic, he's just 
really too good at picking people off that way. And yeah, he, I he doesn't get he doesn't get shaken when he's hit at all. No, and that's something that Felipe Silva is probably used to experiencing. Opponents, their the way they fight changes when they get hit by him, and and uh, the shots that Hajovic landed on Tysimov early may have done that to a less experienced, less composed striker. Yeah, and Silva, his fight with, um, oh, I can't remember. It was Sh- Shane Campbell, his, his yeah. first fight in the UFC. It really showed, like, he didn't so much hurt Campbell initially as he just decided that Campbell couldn't hurt him. Yeah. And so he just started, you know, balled his fists tighter, bit down his mouthpiece, came forward, and just started slugging him until he went away. And it's cool. It's fun as shit to watch. But it's not always, like... It doesn't show maybe the best decision making against somebody who maybe can hurt you. So yeah, yeah. I'm with you. I, I think Sil- Silva probably can do a, a, can perform a little more technically and strategically. As you noted, he's got good technical wrinkles in that crazy aggressive game, but he's inexperienced. I think he's used to running people over, and yeah. so we're essentially measuring shock and awe against a great tactician and Tysimov. Maybe he's not the best defensive fighter in the sport, but he doesn't get rattled when he's hit. He'll happily take a shot, then take an angle and bean you with a counter. He's just, uh, he's looked really good and seems to have gained a new level in terms of accuracy and and devastating power with single punches. So I think that that poise, that tactical thinking is going to win out against what I expect to be a fairly over-aggressive Felipe Silva. And he's rarely there to be hit more than once at a time. Yeah. Yeah, he can be like, tagged because he doesn't really move his head, but yeah, he moves his feet really, really well. So you can hit him once, but then he's going to be at, to your side and trying to hit you right back. Absolutely. Odds on that fight. Uh, they're all out of order over on the odd things. I'm having to actually search for them. Oh, there we are. No one cares about this card, Zane. Not even the odds makers. <laughs> Tysimov opened at minus 190, adjusted down to minus 260, and is minus 255 at this point. Um, Silva opened at plus 150, adjusted up to plus 204, is now plus 203. So, um, you know, that feels about right, honestly. Like, Tysimov deserves to be a a reasonable favorite. Mm-hmm. Silva's big. He's powerful. He's dangerous. He's aggressive. He shouldn't be counted out in this fight, but Tysimov has a good track record of tuning people up and picking them off and making his game work. Uh, that brings us to a welterweight bout, Darren Till, Boyan Velishkovich. One of the better fights on the card again. Um, Vilichkovich still a very slow and ungainly sort of fighter, but if you're going to be slow and ungainly, you can either be a mauler or you can be very technically sound. And finally, in his fight with Nico Musoki, we saw some technical soundness uh, make a difference for Boyan Vilichkovich. Taking short steps, nice angles for counters, getting himself into range without exposing himself to undue punishment. Yeah, he was still caught off guard several times because he doesn't react that quickly. He still had a hard time finding his openings because he doesn't put out a ton of volume and he doesn't hit that hard. So he really had to land a perfect shot to finish that fight, but it was a step in the right direction. And the sad truth for him is that it's probably not enough of a step to beat Darren Till, who is just a technically superb fighter. Darren Till, very, very difficult to hit clean. Even if, I don't think his defensive um, percentage is actually that great on fight metric, but I can't recall other than that. It's probably because of that one round against Nicholas Dalby, in fact, that his number is so low because uh, that he's like got like 58% defense because when he threw out his shoulder in that fight, he was really, really rattled, and Dalby just put it on him and, and hurt him a few times. Other than that, very hard to hit clean, very confident in his defense, happy to let you think you've got a shot in his chin because what he knows is that he's got six feet of space to pull back into behind him. He's got a shoulder to put up in front of his chin. He's got a counter to fire off. Uh, He's a very just systematic uh, Muay Thai style MMA striker. And I like that a lot. He is prone to bouts of inactivity. 
he's happy to just uh like he's he's too confident in some ways which is maybe why i think that dalby rattled him so much when his shoulder was thrown out because suddenly darren till was not unequivocally the better technician in the cage and so it all fell apart really quickly so there's definitely openings for everyone who fights till to beat him on volume to make it ugly to make him work and and pray for an injury but if none of those things happens i think till is probably going to pick village apart and while I think he definitely could finish him, he, I have a feeling he'll coast to a decision after beating Vilichkovic up in the first round. Yeah, Vilichkovic, I mean, you know, we talk about, you, you talked about how you have to either be, uh, what was it? You have to be You can be a mauler or you can be a technician. Yeah. There's actually also another option. Yeah. Which is, you can just be ridiculously tough as shit. Yeah, true. That helps. And that's really no what Lishkovich is. He's yeah. never been knocked out. And a lot of, he like, and it's not because he doesn't get hit, you know? He's just a really tough guy to hurt. Yeah. And that. And he will also to- just wrap his arms around you and cling on <laughs> for three minutes if he gets the chance. Yeah. That serves him all right. But it means, I mean, it also leads to him losing all sorts of fights. Like, just yeah. not being that. A one one and one record in the UFC leading into his last fight. I think one draw, one loss, one win. Yeah. Neither of them particularly impressive. Yeah, and, you know, losing to some guy named Zvet Lazar Savov and Kristoff Yatko, which is... Some guy? Good. Come on, Zane. Zvet, La- Zvet Lazar Savov is my fucking boy. And Gilbert Smith, like, he, you know, he can lose fights to just about any reasonable level of competition. Yeah. And uh, Till is absolutely that. Like, Till is a guy you actually have to go out and beat. Yeah. That's the biggest thing about him. And that's one, you know, like, that is the mark that... It's funny how just being that can win you so many fights in MMA. Yeah. Yeah. No, you actually have to go out and beat this person. Yeah, just being a guy who like takes away your tools and lets you miss and laughs at you. Like yeah. you gotta, you gotta beat him. You gotta take the fight to him because if if you're not focused, he will just let you be unfocused, spinning around in the middle of the cage while he smiles near the fence. Yeah, and then he'll pick you off a few times. I mean, Tyron Woodley's made a whole championship title sure. run out of just being a guy you have to actually beat. Yeah, and Till does a very smart job of uh, bullshitting a little bit to make his yep. inactivity look a lot more impressive even than Woodley's usually does because Till yep. really sells it when he lands a shot or slips a shot. He makes it look good. He's got the, he, do, he does the Diaz thing where, like, yeah. every shot he lands, he's, like, pointing, and, you know, it's like, yeah, come on. That was a good one. You have to acknowledge it because I'm acknowledging it, and half yep. the time they do. <laughs> exactly. Like, well, yeah, <laughs> I am losing this fight. It's smart. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I, I I think Till will take a decision here. Vlachkovic is just too easy to pick off. And he's not a great wrestler or a great grappler. He's yeah. just competent everywhere. And that's probably mm-hmm. not enough. Uh, Darren Till in the odds is at... He's the favorite... Opening at minus 150, adjusted down to minus 202 or 205, and now at minus 199. Um, Vlishkovich opening at plus 110, adjusted up to plus 180, now at plus 164. I frankly think those odds could be a little wider. I think this is a reasonably good matchup for Till. You're muted, dude. My apologies. I hear minus 190 until I think that's probably an opportunity for a small bet. Yeah, it just, it it, it seems, this seems more in line with, like, this seems like it should be flipped with the Habalov green fight where Habalov is at minus, you know, 300 and uh, Till being at minus 190. It's just like, Mm -hmm. Till's probably the better favorite here. Yeah, I agree. Uh, welterweight bout next: Leon Edwards versus Brian Barberena. Man, Another good fight. I have, I have trouble. I have trouble with this one. Mm-hmm. 
This is a tough fight for me. And it seems, I think a lot of people are going to feel like this is not that tough a fight. They're going to say, they're going to look at it and be like, Leon Edwards, he's the more athletic guy. He's flashier. Take him all day. And uh, it's just not quite true. I mean, one of the big problems for Leon Edwards has been that He's not quite as athletic as it seems like he would be. He's fast, but he's not very powerful. He's a hard hitter, but he can be, you know, he can be bullied by dudes like Kamaru Usman and Claudia Silva. You're muted again. <laughs> Sorry, self-imposed technical difficulties now. I think Edwards is kind of like a McGregor where he's got a lot of snap if he can hit you at his range. But this is just occurring to me now because I, I've been watching. Sorry to cut off your no, your fine. analysis, but this might um, color what you were saying. I've been looking at Edwards lately and thinking he's focused on his wrestling, his submission, grappling. They are legit threats now. He is good at them. But when he goes into a fight planning to use them, it seems like his striking isn't really that good anymore. Like he's not that comfortable. And I and I think in the Tumanov fight, I felt it was because he'd focused too much on his wrestling and grappling. But I'm starting to think that maybe Leon Edwards just isn't that great a striker if you pressure him a lot at all. Because as we saw with McGregor against Mayweather, right? Like the power is there at long range. He can land that big uppercut and it looks great. But when you're in close, the mechanics aren't necessarily there to, to like cover that distance and generate that yep. speed. So the punches just don't like he and Edwards seems to know it. Like when someone's in his face, he doesn't feel confident in letting his punches go because I think he realizes they leave him open without doing the kind of damage he wants to do. Yeah, no, I think that that's exactly it. Because you look at his fights, I mean, the thing, when he when his striking looks amazing and flashy, and it as it has in the past, it's always been one-off, long-range shots where he'll just land some bomb on somebody. And you're like, oh my god, that's amazing. Or, or even something small, like a cracking jab or something. But anything that snaps and like yeah. stings somebody... It tends to come from that long space. But, the, I mean, the thing was is that even when he was doing that and looked great, it was always very low output. It was just very like, oh, I'm going to throw one one strike when I see the opportunity, yeah. and that's it. And as he's gone on, like, the, instead of adding volume to his striking as he's gone on, he's added wrestling and grappling. Like, the avenue he went down was not, Oh, I need to become a tighter, higher output striker. Yeah. It's I need to become a better wrestler and grappler. Which might be asking the wrong question. Rather than asking, how do I like get to strike with people? It's like, how do how do I how how do I become more effective striking with people? Yeah. Rather than like just saying, okay, I don't want to get owned on the ground because I'm a striker. Yeah. And it I, it also may just be like, well, when I strike with people who can strike with me, I'm not that comfortable at it. So maybe I should do something else. You know? Yeah. And I think that, like, it, you know, especially in his fight with, like, Vicente Luke, who's a, who's a good striker, who's good, powerful, little bit rote, not the deepest striker in the world, mostly prone to gassing more than anything. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, when that got in tight, like, Edwards got hit hard. And he just got a little lost. He gets lost in exchanges a little bit. Um, and that's why I'm picking Brian Barbarena here because Barbarena is very, very, very hard to out, out wrestle and outwork. Like he's just a really hard guy to hold down. Colby Covington got all the takedowns in the world on him because he's a great wrestler, but literally could not hold him down for 10 seconds at a time. Mm -hmm. Had to just keep going for and chaining takedowns because Barbarina would just get right back up and go right back after him. Now, Covington also outstruck Barbarina, which gives me pause in this fight because Covington is not... He's, he's worked on his striking a lot. He's confident, but he's not the world's best striker. He's, you know, still a bit stiff and still not technically deep but he can really threaten the takedown yeah a lot like that sets up everything he wants to do with his hands and 
if Edwards, so it, Barbarina we know is going to pressure Edwards a lot. And we know that Barbarina is very likely going to get better as the rounds go on. And if Edwards cannot force his wrestling and grappling game on Barbarina for extended stretches, I kind of trust Barbarina's chin and pressure more than I trust Edwards' athleticism there. Yeah, I'm with you, actually. I'm with you on this one. I, I like Barbarina, too. I think the pressure, the pace, the... A, Barbarina is not that easy to hit clean. Edwards will probably land a few good shots, but um, Barbarina tends to adjust pretty well. He typically gets stronger as the fight goes on, and even when he's not like taking over more and more, he still pushes his pace as the fight even goes on. Even in that Covington fight where he was getting worked, he was still yeah. fresh and going in the third oh, round. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 just and, and it's not like a blistering pace, but it builds very slowly and very inexorably. And um, he's also really sharpened up a lot of his technical skills in recent years. The knockout over Joe Proctor was just a delicious left hook. I mean, a really technically sound, pretty left hook. And he sent it up. He set it up by like playing mind games with Proctor too, which I think speaks to his comfort in, in messing with his opponents in the cage and. If Edwards could fight this fight uh, in, in the mold of a Chad Laprise who beat Barbarina, then he could definitely win here. But Barbarina is not as easy to take down as Tumanov. He's not going to freak out when he's taken down, which is a big thing. Like, yeah. Even if he has to get back to his feet, he's not going to fear that the same way that somebody like Tumanov would, who really feels that the striking is their only realm to, to, to beat people. And... I don't think I don't have a lot of faith that Edwards can keep up that kind of Chad Laprise game plan with Bar Barbarina's pressure. I think he'll probably have a good round, but uh, Barbarina is just going to keep tightening the noose and, and ratcheting up the pace. So I, I, I yeah. think Barbarina is a better fighter than he was when he fought yeah. Chad Laprise, and totally. he almost beat Chad Laprise in that fight for sure. Yeah, he's uh, yeah, and uh, so yeah, Barbarina by unanimous decision for me. All right, odds on that fight. Brian Barbarina is uh, plus, he's the sizable, reasonable underdog here. Opened at plus 235, adjusted up and down a lot to plus 262, and then has slowly been trickling down, now at plus 229. And Edwards opened at Minus 315, adjusted up and down to minus 315, and is slowly adjust, moving up to minus 285. So those numbers are slowly getting closer as the fight approaches. I mean, I'm picking Barbarina. That's all I'm going to say. I don't yeah. bet, so I'm not going to put any money on him because I don't put any money on anything ever. But we both do think Barbarina will win. Yeah, and he's a sizable underdog here. Yeah, that's something. Uh, and that brings us to a woman's bantamweight fight. Marion Renault versus Talita uh, de Oliveira Bernardo. Oh, she has more names. Oh, Talita. she's Brazilian. They all, they all have like seven. <laughs> I, didn't, I just put Talita de Oliveira. Yeah. But now so she's... So Wikipedia. almost all the media did, but the UFC has her registered as Talita Bernardo. Yeah. You never know. Um, not an interesting fight because, especially in comparison to what it was supposed to be, GDR Renault would have been a really interesting contest. Talita de Oliveira is totally um, untested. She's just really underexperienced. She's facing a much more experienced fighter in Renault who, yeah, you know, like she doesn't keep a, enough output. She's, she's looked like she's been on the cusp of losing that last step for a while. Like she struggled to really become an aggressive fighter, but she's still been making little small improvements here and there. She's tough. She gutted out a tough fight with Betch Cohea to a draw after not doing so well early. She's fought Holly Holm and Jessica Andrade and Talita Bernardo hasn't fought anyone. So it's Renault by second round TKO. Yeah, Renault will always make every fight she has harder on herself than she has to be. And her ability to knock anyone out is really more of a getting lucky and catching someone than it is 
the work she does in the cage because right. her output is so low and her willingness to throw is so low and commit to anything is so low. But she's gotten technically better. I think I think it's clear you can even see like how hard she has to work against her nature because she's fighting out you know under Rafael Cordero. Like you can see her straining with this idea of like I'm supposed to be aggressive. No, I'm supposed to be <laughs> aggressive. No, I'm supposed to be aggressive, and still just not pulling the trigger. And then every now and then she'll throw like a few punches, and it's like okay, God, I was aggressive there. That's good. <laughs> can, we, can we get more like existential fight nicknames? Because I I just realized how perfect it would be if she came into the cage as Marion. Um, sorry, Marion Identity Crisis Renault <laughs> would be fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, because I remember going to that Betch Cohea fight and people were like, oh, she's just going to destroy her and knock her out. And all that. I was like, have you seen Marion Renault fights? Mm -hmm. Right. But, I mean, the thing is, is Talita Bernardo has the takedown. Yeah. The, so the, here's the other part of this I'm picking Renault by submission because I yeah. don't think T Talita Bernardo knows how to stop herself from going after Renault and Renault is a fantastic grappler. Yeah. The only people who beat Renault, the, the big thing to take away going into this is that the people who beat Renault are strikers. Yep. People don't typically out grappler. So even if uh, Bernardo will very likely get an early takedown, she's going to yep. have to contend with a pretty solid submission game. Yeah. I, I My hope is that Bernardo just comes out and goes after Renault and tries to take her down and Renault gives up the takedown, pulls guard and just hits a triangle and 45 second triangle win. Yeah, that could yeah. happen. That would be my hope because having to watch Renault pick up a try, try and knock her out or pick up a unanimous decision striking is just going to be a chore. Sure. Uh, Marion Renault is a uh, favorite opening at minus 300, adjusting up and down, still minus 300, now minus 308. Uh, Talita de Oliveira Bernardo opening at plus 220, adjusting up and down to plus 240, now at plus 245. You could probably still put a bet on Renault. Yeah, Renault, it would be a pretty, pretty re remarkable win for Bernardo. She's she's not like the most reliable fighter, so that that does give me pause. I'm probably yeah. not going to bet on her, but there's no reason that Bernardo should win this fight. Yeah. All right, that brings us to a middleweight bout. A middleweight bout. C.R. Bahadurzada versus Rob Wilkinson. Yeah, Dude, a real this, winner. Is this it? Middleweight. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure your, why. <laughs> I think, I've forgotten now. I think it's me. Okay, Maybe. go after it. I'll go for it. Um, Bahadur Zada has been super inactive for a long time, but he's still a pretty good fighter with his very limited style. Uh, I thought he looked really sharp against Brandon Fatch, actually. That was his first fight back after three years, and while Fatch has essentially failed to deliver on expectations, uh, Bahadur Zada did in a kickboxing match look pretty good. He just kind of keeps his feet close together, stalks forward, waits for you to do something, and unleashes a bomb. But like Felipe Silva, there's a little bit of craft there too. Bahar Zada hits the body really well, for example. Um, when he's punching, his head starts moving. It doesn't move at all when he's not punching, but when he's in the pocket, uh, it's it, it can be pretty hard to convince yourself to take a swing at his moving head while his fists are coming at you. And um, that's basically all Bahar Zada does is kickbox with people. And I guess that gives, it's kind of a double-edged sword for Rob Wilkinson, who comes in here also as a striker, an Australian fighter who I suspect only ever manages to wrestle his opponents because they aren't that good at wrestling. Um, you know, he'll tie up in a lot of very ugly clinches or get backed into the fence and just bend at the back and grab a leg and get a takedown. And even against CR Bahadur Zada, who's not an amazing wrestler, that kind of stuff is probably not going to work. Uh, Wilkinson does have an edge. A, he's the middleweight in this fight, I guess. So he's, you know, going to be able to use that length to sting Bahadur Zada. Wilkinson has a very good jab. He's got reasonably good footwork and he's tough as shit. He can take a beating 
and get exhausted and still come back and work his way into the fight if you can't finish him. But he loves backing into that fence. He he just is so easy to pressure into that fence. And when he gets there, he's not a great off- a defensive fighter. His offense is really built around his jabs and his kick combinations and not his short punches and range or his clinch. So I think Bahar Dezada, if he looks the way he did in the Thatch fight, is going to win a fun uh, a fun bout, but I think he's probably just going to catch Wilkinson with some big shots, and if not finishing him, I think he'll steal rounds. Let's see. What did I pick here? I went for Bahar Zada by second round TKO. I think that Wilkinson's going to get tired and get beat up. Yeah, Wilkinson, you know, I was watching his fight with Jamie Abdallah, which he did a lot of wrestling in that fight. Like, he was getting tuned up in it, and so he, he turned it into a wrestling match, and it's very much the well, I've clung, I'm clinging to a single leg, and yeah. I can change it to a double leg, and everybody else on the, you know, in Australia is like, "Whoa, whoa!" You know, he wouldn't hit. He wouldn't hit an ace reactive takedowns. He was just <laughs> grabbing was a, a leg and then trying to something. Out your Australian accent there. I gave you the setup. <laughs> Damn it! He couldn't get the takedown. No, oh, like, everybody's like, "Whoa, whoa! What's this? What's this wrestling, mate? We're here to start. Hello, hello! What's this?" <laughs> A takedown, mate. <laughs> Hello, what's this? That's becoming British. <laughs> what's okay. this? I'm becoming now a we... Monty Python. I'm becoming a Monty Python uh, police officer. <laughs> <laughs> what's all this then? A takedown. Oh, and it's just you know, there's a lot of that to his game, and otherwise, as a striker, yeah, he's just stiff. You know, the his jab and. His range strikes are very much head on line, throw this and really, you know, look for you to not have much coming back at me. Otherwise, he'll get hit. And Bahar Zada, the thing, the thing that really sets him apart more than anything else, he's got some craft. He's got tons of experience. He's got ridiculous fucking hand speed. He always has, and it hasn't left him. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of like if Mark Hunt didn't have a big technical boxing game. Yeah. That's Sierra Bahardazada, where it's just like, you see this bald guy who looks just a little out of shape, not way out of shape, just a little, doesn't, you know, throws kicks like by like lifting his whole, like moving his whole torso when he throws a kick kind of thing. Yeah. And you're like, oh, this guy, what, what the hell is this? And then he throws like an overhand. You're like, what the fuck? Yeah, this stiff hipped motherfucker just dropped a bomb. Yeah, that's yeah. that's it's a shame that he hasn't been fighting more frequently because yeah. Bahadurzada just bangs, man. He's he's always fun to watch. And his hands are so fast. Yeah. Really ridiculously fast. And Rob Wilkinson's sort of stiff range game just uh yeah. I, I think he's gonna get knocked out. That is if CR Bahadurzada does not get arrested mid fight by Inspector Flying Fox of the Yard. <laughs> be a real problem oh well yeah okay they're not fighting in the u.s i thought you were gonna say that ice was gonna get him but oh yeah no i wasn't going for the political i was just continuing on the monty python references although i have heard that inspector flocks of the 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 light entertainment police has joined up with ice so (laughs) that's a little troubling all right on that note uh odd for that fight (laughs) (laughs) odd for that fight C.R. Bahadizada is the favorite, uh, opening at minus 150, adjusted up and down to minus 155, now at minus 146. Rob Wilkinson opening at plus 110, uh, adjusted up to plus 126, now at plus 120. Um, Any props? What about Bahadizada by TKO? Prop bets on that. Uh, Bahar Dezada inside the distance is plus 112. Yeah. Yeah. He's been out so much lately. True. Yeah. Why am I even thinking about betting on this? Just yeah. enjoy it, right? Just to watch it and enjoy it. Yeah. All right. That brings us to our main event Alexander Volkov versus Stefan Struve. Uh, they're tall. They so. really doubled down on that promotional angle. They, um, it was pointed out to me that the poster has Stefan Struve's head cut off by the top, which uh, so they're really doubling down. 
And then the whole, the promo video was literally just about how they're the two tallest guys in the UFC. <laughs> that was the only selling point. <laughs> oh, God. All heavyweights. Right. Got to have a heavyweight main event, Zane. So they're tall. And I, you know, this fight is a little hard to call because credit to Stefan Struve. He really does look like he's ridden through his durability problems to be a technically more confident fighter than he yeah. used to be. Or at least maybe he, to be more technical and as confident as he was when he knocked out uh, um, Stipe? Stipe Miocic all those years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that win over Stipe Miocic was... Jesus Christ, where is that win even on his record? Uh, yeah, that, that's 2012. So that's five mm-hmm. years ago now. After which he got, you know, he had that Mark Hunt fight, which was just a, a crime, really, in retrospect. Mm-hmm. And then Alistair Overeem, which was an extreme crime. <laughs> that's like, and then Mark, Mark Jared Hunt is the crime. Alistair Overeem is like the hate crime. Yeah, and then Jared Rochelt, which is a crime against nature, that fight. Yeah, that's a crime <laughs> for all of us. <laughs> but, you know, he got put in with two extreme power punchers who are both more technical than him, and it just was no fun. But uh, since then, he's slowly been turning that around to try and regain his confidence that got shot to hell after that. And his, his health scare, obviously, with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and his Omelanchik fight, he looked confident. Mm-hmm. He looked willing to just go out there and throw hands at the dude and come after him, attack as much as he could, and be a confident fighter. Uh, I almost think that Struve may have gotten his confidence back by sort of abandoning the idea. Like I think we saw him probably struggling with the idea that he's supposed to be the long-range striker. Yeah, yeah. And he never did it. No. And he, in the one fight in which he did it, kind of was against Big Nog, and it still wasn't a great performance. Yeah. And then, I like you can say Struve shouldn't be fighting this way, and, and you know he shouldn't be like getting in close and throwing combinations and covering up when he's only when he's three feet away from his opponent, when he could easily take one step back and be too far away for anyone in the division to hit him. But that's how Struve fought for his whole career, and I think that's what he's comfortable doing is just putting it on people. And, and the truth is, too, for as tall as he is, um, his arms aren't that long. His arms aren't that long. Yeah, nobody's arms could be long enough to be proportional proportional to Stefan Struve's torso. Yeah, so he, you know, he kind of, like there's some phys- physiology there that mental like is just going to draw him into that kind of fight. Yeah. At a certain point, like you want to be tall and long, that's a great advantage in fighting. But at a certain point. It just makes you like a weirdly put together guy. Like yeah. Stefan Struve is just a weird shape for a man. And <laughs> that's been a struggle for him throughout his whole MMA career is like, how do I make this shape work for MMA? And it's hard. Yeah. So the the value there of a more confident Stefan Struve is that he's a very good grappler. Yeah. And Alexander Volkov gives up takedowns like they're his lunch money and the world is a bully. He just Struve's not a bad wrestler either. He doesn't shoot a lot, but he tends he to get because you can't you can't yeah. get your hips lower than your you yeah. can't get your hips. Yeah. But he's got trips and throws and uh when he goes for a takedown, I think his percentage is pretty damn high actually. It's like 60% of his takedowns attempted he completes he he, he yeah. can get it down if he needs to he's got a good trip and throw game because he also has a, a, a shit ton of leverage yeah like the same things that make it impossible for him to hit a double leg ever right. in his life make him a very good like very good for judo because he could get like an outside trip like hook your leg and lift it up and your leg would be over your shoulder <laughs> like, exactly. like yeah. I, I can't remember what the fight was maybe it was the omelanchik fight there was I feel like there was another fight too where somebody tried to like judo throw Stefan Struve. It's just like, 
He just like falls on you. That's all that's gonna happen. <laughs> you just gave him mount. Yeah. 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 Um that's a big problem for Volkov. Also a problem because Volkov is a very willing clinch striker. He's a good clinch striker, but he has no takedown defense when he does it. I would say that Volkov's wrestling has gotten a little better since he came to the UFC. Yeah. Um he stopped one takedown from Tim Johnson who criminally only went for two takedowns fighting Volkov, but... But Roy Nelson also, also did just go yeah. out and put him on his back immediately. Yeah, but he, he did pretty well to stop takedowns as that fight went on. Well, yeah, Roy Nelson also just exhausted True. every ounce of energy. And he's, he's also Roy Nelson. He's like a nine, 900-year-old Roy Nelson, so... Yeah. That's fair. 137 um, years old. I am still picking Volkov because Drew's chin, I think it can't be totally repaired. He's never had a good chin, and I do think that it got damaged to the point that he is really, truly chinny now. And Volkov is very hard to put away on the ground. Mm -hmm. Volkov has reasonably good cardio, especially for a heavyweight, and he's a good scrambler off of his back. He's hard to submit. He's only been submitted early in his career. And he is hard to keep down. And I think he's big enough to actually, like, make that work against Struve in a way that, like, if you're a six-foot heavyweight, having Struve fall on you is a much more difficult proposition. Yeah. So I think he can get back to his feet enough, and he's just a much more durable striker at that point that mm -hmm. I have to pick him to win and, it. and Volkov lies within the he lies within the scope of normal human shapes. Yes. So like he's a tall guy who very well understands how to use his size. Yep. He he's got a great jab. Uh one of the best jabs in the heavyweight division right now, probably. Uh the rest of his game built around it is not stellar, but very quick, non-telegraphed, lancing left hand. He is happy to sit down on an overhand or throw a bomb now and then, but unlike Struve, he doesn't like lead with uppercuts. He doesn't engage in close range willingly unless he's stepping in to land a shot. And I just think that sort of tactical and strategic sense of what you're supposed to be doing at any given moment in the fight is going to be a big advantage in a five round bout with, uh, you know, frankly, past his prime, Stefan Struve. Yeah. So I think Volkov is. I will say, in MMA, I tend to really enjoy striking battles between two guys who are used to being taller than their opponents. It's, uh, it's almost always fun because it, they tend to fight at a much faster pace than they're used to because the other guy can touch them where they're used to not being touchable. So I think we might be in for a pretty cool kickboxing battle here. And if these guys go back and forth for two or three rounds, trading jabs, looking for openings for kicks, uh, we could be in for something cool. But... Yeah. Uh, Ultimately, I think that Volkov is just going to be a little too sharp. Yeah, I mean, rest. it's hard to at heavyweight to see to not see Volkov as the the better cardioed, more durable fighter. Yeah. And then look at a fight. You're looking at a heavyweight fight. And you're like, well, this guy's got better cardio, and he's more durable. I'm going to pick the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that's it. I can I can tell you all the things about how he's going to answer Struve's jab or find openings in his guard or explode back from takedowns, but. He'd never been knocked out. I think he was maybe TKO'd once by cuts or something. Yeah, maybe. Uh, Way early by Vitaly Minikov, who was yeah, like Minikov a, TKO'd him. Who was one. like a tank, you know, who will take you down yeah. and beat the shit out of you. And other than that, he's never had any problems with his chin. Yep. And he doesn't get tired that easily. So nope. that's enough. Yep. All right. Uh yeah, on that note, odds for that, Alexander Volkov is the favorite opening at minus 175 and slowly trending up to minus 126. So all the money coming in on Struve. Struve, the underdog, opening at plus 135 and dropping down to plus 101 now. There are... I have noticed every time Stefan Struve fights, there are a ton of people who have absolute unerring faith in his submission game. And and fair enough. The submission game does not get enough yeah. play from Stefan Struve. He's, he's easily among the best submission grapplers at heavyweight right now. Yeah. And has been really dangerous in that phase for a long time. But it's a matter of 
like, I don't know who are the, the, th the other question is who are the guys Stefan Struve has submitted? Yeah. He'd not I, been submitting like amazing grapplers. He couldn't no. submit Mark Hunt. Yeah. He submitted Daniel O'Malanchuk. He submitted LeVar Johnson, Pat Barry, uh, Chase Gormley, Dennis right. Stojnich. It's a great submission game, but it pretty in the context of a fight, it mostly works against guys who you would assume Struve would submit before the fight. So yeah. that's the difference. Absolutely. All right. On that note, you can find me on Twitter at these ain't time. You can find Connor on Twitter at boxing Bush, B U S C H. You can find both of us over at bloodyelbow.com and uh, find our videos over at MMA nation.com D O T C O M on YouTube. While you're there, give them a like thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Uh, that'll, that all helps us a ton. That way you get all the, the latest Bloody Elbow shows, videos, news, analysis, all the things we do week in, week out. Uh, we'll be back. I'll be back for the sixth round after uh, this event, after UFC Rotterdam, and then we'll be back next week for UFC 215, Johnson versus Borg, and we will have the Care, don't care, the vivisection, if I did it, heavy hands, all that good stuff we do week in, week out. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in, and we will see you soon.